Hey everyone, it's Phil Hall of Westria Communications, and today I am privileged to have as my guest Tom Katsileas. He is the president of the University of Connecticut. And Tom, thank you so much for taking time from your very, 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 three very busy schedule. <laughs> thank you for having me, Phil. It's a pleasure to join you. Before, when we were setting up the, the interview, you had mentioned that today was uh, your first in-person meeting at the school. What was that all about? Oh yeah, well, um, I didn't. I realized as I was getting onto the video with you that I was still wearing my mask, and uh, so it's auspicious. This is other than doing laboratory tour visits and things like that, uh, checking on students, those kinds of things. This was my first uh, in-person at, at a safe distance uh, meeting with some of my leadership team uh, since we sent students home last spring. So. It, it felt very good to be back in, though it's um, so it's going to take some getting used to wearing the masks. And that's not any ordinary mask; that's a husky mask, isn't it? Oh yeah. Did you did you notice that? I get a lot of compliments on this. So this is, um, yeah, the, yeah. The one engineering faculty member who had gotten a hold of some precious fa fabric and uh, made this and and kindly gave it to me. Wow, Tom, if I can ask a question, I don't want to sound like a silly person asking, but. How have you been able to hold up over these past few months? This is, must have been probably the most extraordinarily <laughs> stressful time of your career. Yeah, it's um, it's been unusual. I, I you know I I went from being a first year president uh, for the first four months of my presidency and doing all the things first year presidents do, like uh, you know traveling uh, to different parts of the country to meet with alumni groups, getting to know you know donors and. Uh, getting to know the faculty, touring the various schools, uh, to suddenly being, um, you know, the last four months being thrust into sort of emergency and crisis management um, on a pretty daily basis. And uh, so, you know, it occurred to me that I, I kind of aged four months and then four years over the next months. So I, I don't feel like a first year president anymore. I, I feel like a seasoned, yeah. Uh, sort of tested veteran, but um, I'm holding up okay, thank you, yeah. So with UConn, when are the students going to be back on campus? Uh, so they'll be back in the middle of August. So we just made an announcement this week that we're going to keep our original calendar, which has classes starting on August 31st, uh, but we will actually be bringing students back into the residence halls um, in a reduced density beginning the middle of August because we we are planning and we haven't worked out the details of this but a, a phased in a return so that we can perform the the uh, testing of every student who's returning and every uh, student facing uh, staff member as well so this is part of the governor's workforce on higher education they came up with gating conditions on what uh, would be the guidelines for returning to in-person instruction. And uh, we, you know, they're they uh, driven first and foremost by you know, safety and public health over everything else. So uh, we participated in developing those guidelines, but we really relied heavily on uh, public health uh, experts on uh, what would be safe. And those guidelines include uh, the requirement that the uh, the disease be on the decline, um, which it has been. I hope it stays that way because uh, that's a that's one that's kind of beyond our control. But there are other requirements that have to be in place as well, uh, including the availability, including testing of all students uh, and student facing faculty before returning, and uh, and contact tracing capability, uh, isolation and quarantine capability shutdown plans and contingency plans and all of that kind of stuff. So we've been working very hard on meeting those gating conditions. We're growing uh, more optimistic that we will be able to, to meet them and um, be able to open uh, in a low den lower than previous density, but still open with a mix of uh, in-person and uh, online and hybrid education in the fall. I saw on the, the UConn website that uh, after Thanksgiving, the students are going to be leaving the campus and the remainder of the semester is going to be online. Why did you decide to do that? Yeah, this is a pretty uh, common at uh, peer institutions around the country. It's, it's this uh, realization, recognition of the fact that sending students home 
all over the country and all over the world. Um, and, and having that extra travel as well as the extra mixing uh, adds a considerably more risk to the strategy of keeping students uh, and staff safe and healthy because this part of the strategy of students in the dorms is to create a safe haven out of the dorms. But once they go off and mix, that strategy came, becomes much more difficult. So the decision uh, that many of us are making is that we have uh, our in-person instruction up until the Thanksgiving break, then the last two weeks of instruction and finals take place online. Excellent. Speaking of online, what did UConn do this past semester to ensure that the quality of education was equal to what the students would have been getting in the classroom? Well, you know, uh, it's, it, we were one of the earliest to give notice to our faculty to prepare for uh, the eventuality of being online. And we gave our faculty two weeks notice. Some of our peers, it was only two days. So things, two, two weeks in it, and we all kind of went online at about the same time. So it, it was about the rapid evolution of the disease. And at the time that we asked faculty to begin preparing, it was really a hypothetical. No one really expected that we were going to be pulling the trigger on that. And uh, you know, within, within two weeks, we in fact did pull the trigger and, and went to all online by necessity. Uh, we fortunately had um, you know, a significant history of online instruction across all of our, our schools and departments. So we had that expertise to draw upon. We knew a lot about synchronous and asynchronous pedagogies and which worked in different types of classes and different size classes. So uh, we have a Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, which we call CETL uh, for, the, for its acronym. And uh, CETL has a lot of expertise that it could share with faculty, plus our faculty themselves who had experience with, with online instruction became mentors uh, and really a, a community of support for other faculty for whom this was new. And, uh, you know, the, overall it was very successful in the sense, su sense that we have over 5,000 courses. And in the end, we didn't cancel a single course. So um, we declared victory. I would say uh, I, I'm always remiss in recognizing the role of graduate students in all of this and the undergraduates, but the, the graduate students had to play a dual role. Many of them were teaching assistants, helping students with this adjustment to online, but also acting as, as uh, also being students themselves. So they were both teachers and learners. They had to play both sides of the field and uh, they did a fantastic job. So we, we felt that it was a, um, all in all, a big success. Uh, my, you know, my, tool, my favorite tool of assessment of how things went is I, I meet with lots of students virtually and in person. And uh, every student I've asked, I said, what was the more difficult adjustment? Was it the social adjustment or the academic adjustment? And I have yet to, to get an answer that it was academic. Every single student said the social adjustment was the more difficult one. So I take that as a, a inferentially that the, that the online pedagogy, you know, delivered, you know, the, the, uh, the, the knowledge and the content. It's not, it, it's not what anybody wanted. And, and what we've learned from this is certainly not what students prefer. So, you know, I had this interesting conversation with um, Senator Chris Murphy. Um, and he was asking me if uh, the experience of going online would represent a step towards the, the end of residential colleges, because once people realized that this modality uh, could, could be uh, effective and cheaper and all of those things. And um, I said, actually, the, what we learned and we couldn't have anticipated is that it's just the opposite, that what we've heard from students is, yeah, they got the knowledge that that they needed to pass the course, but it's not what they were seeking from a residential college experience and they can't wait to get back. And we're seeing that in our fall applications, which are considerably up and our messages from our parents and our students, which is, are you gonna be back in person? And that's, that's what I'm looking for. Well, one thing you can't really do online is sports. Uh, and of course, UConn has one of the best sports programs in the country. What's going to be happening in the fall with uh, the football, basketball, and the other team sports? Yeah, it, you know, we're taking uh, pilot steps right now and got in accordance with the, the governor's workforce um, 
uh, guidelines uh, to do um, to bring to start bringing um, athletes back onto campus in June, and we're working towards bringing uh, football players back on campus in in July, and the first steps towards that, um, you know, it won't look like traditional um, spring training. That's for sure. It's it's uh, you know initially the students will be working uh, with a distance with a, tr a coach or a trainer at a distance by themselves uh, and not mixing. There'll be a quarantine period, they'll be testing, and then uh, gradually they'll begin to interact in, in some sort of pods um, where the pods are um, uh, kept as a kind of family unit. And this is also part of the guidelines from the governor's task force. And um, so, you know, it, and then it's a ramp up procedure from there. And um, so we don't know the answer to your question, what, what fall sports will look like. We do know we're working towards resuming them and, and um, we're making pretty good progress. I mean, there were a couple of, of um, milestones we had to achieve before, before um, the football players could come back July 1st. And we haven't, we haven't checked off every box yet, but between now and July 1st, looks like we will. So they will get started and it won't look the same, but, um, and then we'll just have to take it from there and see what happens. Um, you know, I will share with you that um, for a lot of us in academia, there was a time where we couldn't imagine how you could resume um, intercollegiate, intercollegiate athletics um, in the COVID era that in sa safely. I mean, you imagine large numbers of students throwing themselves at each other and uh, exchanging all kinds of bodily fluids and very close contact in the uh, most extreme way. And, um, you know, the, the thought that I, you know, the, the, well, the, I wouldn't say the thought, but the, um, the evolution of the possibility is um, that you can imagine uh, if there, if you can maintain a low, low number, low enough number of uh, COVID cases, that you could do, a, you know, testing of a of a team, um, 24 hours before a competition, and the other the other um, school could do a similar testing. And and if everyone is negative and they're isolated for that 24 hours, then you can feel pretty comfortable that they would be able to compete against each other without posing any health risk, other than the usual broken bones, but not an infectious disease health risk uh, to each other. Um, one, you know, the enabling technologies here are the, are the developments in testing and the developments are impressive. Um, the, you know, they're, the CDC, uh, as of the first of this month has approved self-administration of tests. So that's a big step forward. Um, our partner at Jackson labs, which has been a key partner in all of this and, uh, a, you know, a, a, world famous genomics research facility, but has been advancing and developing testing capacity as well, uh, is successfully benchmarked saliva tests recently. So that becomes a possibility. So when you start thinking about uh, um, self-administered saliva tests, uh, the barrier to doing testing before each type of sporting event becomes much more doable. The other part of it is uh, a technique called pooling. And that is where you, you actually don't need to test. Um, you can test every person uh, by only making a fraction of the number of tests of the number of people. The idea is you put, say, five to 10 tests, uh, samples into one test. And if all 10 individuals are negative, then, then uh, potentially you would need one test to validate that they were all negative. And, um, and so that drastically reduces the number of tests you would have to do, provided that the positive rate is low enough. And obviously then if you got a positive, you'd have to go back and test all 10 individuals to find out you know, which ones were positive and, and isolate those, those individuals. Well, of course, the COVID-19 crisis is not the only crisis that is impacting this country at this time. We're also reevaluating our social fabric and our history. What is UConn doing to ensure that students uh, have a better understanding of the true diverse nature of American history and also to encourage more students of color uh, to be able to access higher education? Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, we, we have to, to reaffirm our commitment um, to um, diversity and, and inclusion and particularly to our black community that, that um, uh, has su suffered so much um, racial injustice and uh, racism that uh, we are behind them and we are committed uh, to supporting them and to supporting change in society and doing it through the ways that, um, that we can as a university and um, things that we do well. And so we had a, a very productive, I thought, town hall um, virtually um, about a week ago, uh, conducted by our African American Cultural Center and uh, attended by several hundred people and, and some thoughtful panelists. And several of the students had noted the success that we'd had in uh, creating, creating on the fly a university course um, on the COVID crisis that brought to bear the uh, scholarly expertise and perspective of a, of a research university and shared that insight and answered the questions that only that scholarly perspective could bring uh, to the students who were craving that knowledge. And 5,000 students signed up for this one credit course uh, that was not required and 4,000 of them completed it, including all of the assignments. So this was uh, extraordinary and uh, you know, the students had the idea that now would be the time to do something simpler, similar as a university course on uh, racism in society. So that's an area in which we can contribute. But we also need to reflect on our own practices and, and uh, you know, address uh, structural racism that exists in any uh, predominantly white institution uh, with a long history and, um, and uh, really, um, you know, uh, be introspective and reflective on, on what more we can do. And I hope we can also um, provide leadership, um, you know, on a national, on a national level. Um, you know, we've been talking with deans about um, developing additional uh, degree programs, masters in public safety, and um, that would train the next generation of police leaders, for example, uh, in, um, in more advanced practices that uh, that are evidence based, research based, that are effective and um, the not and not racist, uh, there are University of New Haven has has a program in in uh, police and fire safety. There might there might be a possible partnership there, um, and then you know working with um, our legislator legislative leaders, um, been talking to them about you know could we partner on any particular legislation? Could our law school uh, help work with them to, to do something that would um, bring about more rapid change. I mean, I, I just have the sense and we all have the sense that, um, you know, that the, we've seen change occur. Uh, you know, Ferguson is an example where six years later, um, there are apparently real reforms in the police and the leadership of, of the city and the, and the police department, but we can't afford to wait for one city at a time and one tragedy uh, we can't afford another tragedy um, to it, to be the the stimulus for a city at a time. It has to be the whole nation and much more quickly. So, trying to figure out what we can do to to um, play a role in that and um, and support it. And Tom, if we were to uh, reconnect one year from today, where do you see UConn at that time? So, boy, that's a that's a. a a lovely um, thing to imagine because we'll, you know, the COVID crisis in particular would be past its 12 to 18 month uh, expected window towards herd immunity, vaccine development, et cetera. So uh, it, we, we could imagine that a year from now that we would be back to a new normal and uh, that, um, that, the threat of the COVID disease would uh, have been suppressed to the point that it's um, maybe on the level of an influenza or something like that, um, of something that, of great concern, but something that we address with vaccination and other, other approaches. Uh, and then I think your question is leading to how will we look different? What will the new normal look like? And, and I, would, I would say that, um, uh, you know, we will have learned a lot from this grand experiment in global education where the entire world has gone online for a period of time. And what we will learn is uh, 
what aspects of in-person instruction are most critical and most valuable to keep in person and what things, in what ways can we use uh, technology to increase the value of in-person interaction, not replace it. And so I would expect we would see just as robust as ever residential college experience. I think what we see is that students crave uh, the intellectual collisions that come from mixing of students uh, in high density from lots of different backgrounds. And so hopefully we'll be able to, to get back to that, which they value so much, as well as the, the socialization that goes with that, the spirit and the school spirit associated with uh, um, performances and athletics and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, we hopefully be able to come back to the, to the best of, of uh, the college experience, but with um, an increased appreciation for uh, the value of in-person interaction. Tom Katsuleos, thank you so much for being a guest on today's episode. Thank you, Phil. Okay, folks, see you again next week. Have yourselves a good one. Was that really 20 minutes?